<laughs> He's a literalist. He'll do it for me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, no, it's not. No, don't bother. Okay, just English today. Okay, what we want to do today, because it's Thanksgiving Sunday, we want to do something special, and we had a number of ideas, and, and, and they had to keep getting fine-tuned. But what we'd like to do today uh, that is working, I hope, is we'd like to have three different testimony devotionals. We need to give thanks. We need opportunities to give thanks. And we're going to give you all, before you leave this room, we're going to give you all an opportunity to give thanks in a special way. I know that's scaring you, but don't worry. You don't have to stand behind a mic or anything. We're just going to give you an opportunity to write something down as a Thanksgiving offering to the Lord. What we're going to do is we're going to have uh, three different people get up and just share for about 10, 10, 15 minutes on, on why they're thankful, what God's been showing them, and how to, we can pull this together is as a time of thanksgiving. So, Linda and Ardella, I'd like you to come first. You're, you're, you're first on. That's okay. And, and Linda's going to share about 10, 10, whatever, 10, 12, 15 minutes, just on, 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 th- on thankfulness, but also specifically what God's been, been showing her through one of our courses, okay? So let's listen to her and give her full attention to her and, and be inspired by what she has to say. We receive you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. My name is Linda Nardella. Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Lord and guests. Um, I want to tell you how I gave my son Michael over to God. It was a 13-year struggle that started in 1998, and it finally ended this year in March of 2011. And the reason I want to talk about this is because it happened as a result of a Bible study called Life's Healing Choices that I took in this church. And what happened in August of 1998 is that my son had his first epileptic seizure with convulsions. And he was taken to the Charles Lemoyne Hospital and they said to me that he had um, malformation in the brain. And the malformation consisted of arteries and veins that were all intertwined like this, like a plate of spaghetti, and it's the size of my fist, and it's right here in the right frontal brain. One month later, in September of 1998, uh, he was diagnosed with a tumor in the ankle of his right foot. The operation on his foot took place, Seven months later, it was successful. In the meantime, Michael and I are going to various doctors, neurologists and neurosurgeons, in and out of hospitals. And um, it, it was a seesaw of emotions because every time we went to see a neurosurgeon, they would say, well, you have to perform a lobotomy. We have to remove this mass because if we don't, it's, he's going to have an aneurysm. And if he has an aneurysm, it means he can die, he can be paralyzed, either complete paralysis or partial paralysis, or he, pardon me, or he can go into a coma, any of these forms. In the meantime, coming back to his foot five months after the operation, the doctor who performed the operation said that uh, that the tumor was malignant. So now we're told he's got bone cancer. So he went through more tests and later on they said, no, he doesn't have bone cancer. So you know, it was was like this and I was crying a lot. And you know, in spite of all this, I I was never angry with God. In fact, I I was praising him. I knew, I said, Lord, you're in control. I would say the words. I even sensed his presence. I knew he was there. So when he turns 18 years old, he de- okay, we're not talking about the brain operation anymore because we've seen enough doctors. Four neurosurgeons say operate. Four neurologists say don't operate. What do you do? Um, so if he has the operation, if he gets this mass removed, it's a lobotomy. And you know what that does? You remove part of the brain, there's consequences. On the other hand, he doesn't get the operation and he can die, paralyzed, whatever. 
So it was, seemed like a no-win situation. When he turns 18, he went to work as a tree planter in BC. He did that for seven years. And when he was out there, my imagination went wild. Every time the phone rang, it was, oh my gosh, it's his crew boss telling me he's been rushed to the hospital by helicopter because they work out in the wilds there. Or, you know, it's the police calling me that, you know, he's dead or whatever. So, <clears throat> now we move forward to when he's 24 years old and he moves to Hong Kong. He's now in Hong Kong. He's now 29 years old. His foot is in great shape. And with regards to the brain operation, um, I just didn't want to talk about it. I couldn't face this. I was just drained from all the emotion of the ups and the downs and whatever the consequences would be. However, he brought it back two years ago. He started talking about having a brain operation again, that he was looking into it with doctors in Hong Kong. So this past Christmas, I went to visit him. And uh, I arrived uh, in Hong Kong on a Thursday. And on the Friday, I hit the ground running, boom, right away, starting to meet the neurosurgeons. I was in and out of hospitals, doctor's offices, because I met with these uh, specialists more than once. And while Michael was working, I would go to the hospital to update his records or to get papers, bring papers from here to there, pills from... Anyway, that was my trip. <laughs> and um, I got myself sick. I made myself physically ill to the point where I had to visit a doctor for myself. And um, all the tests that I went through, the pills and the visits came to about $1,300. So thank God I had insurance, travel insurance, they covered everything. But when I came back to Montreal in January, I had to go see my doctor because I needed more antibiotics, more pills. And, and you know, all the trip back to Montreal in January from between Hong Kong and Montreal, I cried all the way because I... <sighs> anyway. So then, I decided to join this Bible study, Life's Healing Choices. Lesson one, God zaps me. <laughs> oh, did he zap, what a revelation. You know what I found out in lesson one? I was a control freak. I found that out. I wanted to hang on to my son. I wanted to hang on to him. And on my way, I was so excited that he showed this to me. And on my way home, I was in the car. I said, okay, Lord, I'm a control freak. I don't want to be a control freak. But how do I stop controlling? How do I stop this? I don't know what to do. And the answer came a couple of weeks later, where I had a very, very strong impression. There were two discs. One disc was there. I knew that was God. I looked on this side, I knew this disc or this fear was me, Linda. The minute I put my eye on this disc, I got a word, constipation. <laughs> nice, nice. Constipation, you know, oh, I'm holding back, oh, I gotta hold back, it's me. And I realized I was in God's way. I was holding back. Those two discs should have been together. God's will and my will should have been together, but no, I set him apart. And one thing I learned in that first lesson was that control is pride. God, you move away. I'm in control. I wanted to control my son's life. I wanted to control where he would have his operation. I didn't want him to have an operation. He wanted to have the operation. Who was going to operate on him, the conditions and everything else like that. So the minute I took my eyes off of God and I looked at me, I got sick. Okay, so now, um, where was I? The constipation? <laughs> constipation. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I, I said, okay, Lord, you know, because I... I what he showed me, instead of fixing it right away, what he showed me is where the problem lay. And you know where the problem lay? 
right here. I was the problem. I was in the way of God working in my son's life and controlling his life. Mummy wanted to control the baby, 29-year-old baby. Okay, so the next day is session four. Life's healing choices is not lessons, it's sessions. So there's a key verse, and the key verse is this. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, don't forget, I was the control freak. I was sinning because I let pride. I, was, I had pride. That was my sin. From Isaiah 118, no matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can take it out and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. And I understood all I had to do now was to confess. Just to confess my sin of pride and of wanting to control. And you know what? It worked. It worked. I gave Michael over to God, and <clears throat> I, I am just so free now. Excuse me. <clears throat> I just feel so free. I don't call him like I used to. I don't send him care packages like I used to. I'm not like I used to be. Now, you know what? I even forgot to call him for his birthday. That's how <laughs> he left. He left me. Yeah. Eh? What? Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's what happened. What happened is I, I got home one night. In fact, it was after a Bible study. And there was a message from my son. Hi, mom. I'm calling to say hi and I love you. Okay, fine. Call me back. Uh, yeah, well, I don't have time right now. You know, I'm busy now. That's how detached I have become from my son. I love him. The first thing I do in the morning when I wake up is I pray for him. But I am so deep. You know the umbilical cord? Zip, zip. It's cut. And two days later, he calls me back. This time, I'm at home. And he says, hi, mom. How are you? Well, yeah, I'm fine. He says, where have you been? I said, I don't know, Mike. I'm busy. He said, well, he said, you know, you didn't even call me for my birthday. Oh, I said, Mike, I'm sorry. Happy birthday. <laughs> that was it. So, <laughs> and, and you know what else happened? He came here in July and August, and he was telling me since uh, February, he said, I think I'm going to have my operation in June before coming to Montreal. And you know, before it would have been like, <laughs> now I've said, oh, you know, eventually, now that I learned that I had let go of my son, I said, Lord, you are in control now. If you want that operation, thank you so much. If you don't, you just close that door. Well, what happened is that another doctor now was in on the scene, and he was giving conflicting reports with the other doctors. So now he was so confused, he didn't know what to do, so he didn't do anything. So you see? All right. <laughs> so if you're struggling with something that God needs to fix, why not use the resources that are available in this church? You know, it could, maybe it's not controlled. Maybe it's something else. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for your transparency. And, and thank you for being honest with us. And Lord, we do pray for Michael. God, you would just touch him. You will touch him and bring him to complete wholeness in Jesus' name. Okay, Sandy's going to come and share her testimony, her story. And we'll hear an update about Mike at the same time. Morning. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Mike and about um, the whole situation that happened and how um, I am thankful and Mike is thankful, our family is thankful, and how um, circumstances of life have brought us to... Um, a huge step of faith <laughs> and trust in God. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, my husband, Mike, Pastor Mike, had an accident with a lawnmower that he backed up and he fell backwards and the lawnmower came upon his foot and um, amputated the toe partially. And so he's been undergoing op um, operation and... Uh, and it was always between whether or not the toe was going to be saved or, or not saved. And it was always this back and forth. We never knew hour to hour whether or not it was going to be there. Um, so 
the, day, the time that it happened, I was driving uh, to the store to get some stuff for Destiny here, and um, my cell goes off, and I pull off on the side, and I answer it, and uh, it's my dad. My dad's 84. He has no idea how to use a cell phone, so it was a kind of a shock for me, but it was Mike's cell phone that he was using. And so I said, hello, and expecting Mike's voice, but it was my dad. And the minute he, he just says, okay, everything is all right, don't worry. And you know it's not good. You just know that. I've got everything under control. Don't worry about it. What's going on? Um, Mike had an accident with the lawnmower. And I'm just thinking, then all these visions come in my head, right? And then I just say, call 911. And he goes, I've already done that. And my dad is 84. And, and I could feel that his heart rate is up. And he's all nervous and everything. So I'm worried about him, too. And, and, then, and he says, are you coming home now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm coming home now. And then I hang up. And then all of a sudden, you could just see the, spiritually, you can just sense the darkness coming in. And then, so you're, I'm fighting against that happening, and I'm fighting against my emotional buildup that's going to come, and trying to think, okay, what do I need to do now? And so, um, I call Pastor Dave, <laughs> and, and I, had to, I had to say every single word. I had to force myself to say every single word and it was like, um, there was just an accident. It was just, it was so, I had to do that. Just so that my mind and my motion would stay focused on what I had to do to tell them I can't go get the cups. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so I just went on my way and I was driving. And then, you know, you just, you, you just feel the, the emotion and the stress coming in. And, and I am just declaring out loud, you know, you know, you know God, God, you know, you, I trust you. You are worthy. And um, I, I know that you're going to be there. And I want you to bring, put, put your shalom peace on Mike. And I'm just calling in the kingdom into the situation at all time and saying, get me home all right, you know, because I'm not thinking. <laughs> I'm trying to think to drive, but all this stuff is happening, and I just keep declaring, 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 and then I can just feel my emotions rising up again, and I just have to keep pushing it away, and uh, keep going for uh, bringing God's situation into it, God's kingdom into the situation, um, because, you know, on a good day, we're good. <laughs> we're really good as Christians on a really good day, you know? <laughs> you know but when situations happen and we've all had our times of situations when they come in who do we say we are who are we yeah. who are we when we're there you know so we have to remember who we are we have to push through push through this darkness that comes in, push through the emotional stuff that happens, just to keep pushing through to know that in all circumstances, God is there. So anyway, so I make it home, and um, the police are there, and the ambulance are there, so I've never seen both. <laughs> I've seen ambulances come to my house, but not both, and so I was fear again. I said, no, no, no. So I go in the back, and uh, everybody's there, and then I'm walking forward, and I see one of the relatives of, my, of Mike who said that he was going to come and spend a couple of weeks with us because he needs to take a course here, and he's just standing there going, I just got here, <laughs> and this is happening. And I'm walking towards Mike, and then all of a sudden, all the hands go up and go, stop, you know, from the ambulance because Mike doesn't want me to come and see what's going on. Which wasn't a good idea, because it just makes my mind go. <laughs> I'd rather would have seen. And then, and then I hear about an artery. So all I'm thinking about main arteries, blood going. Ten minutes you have to live, maybe. <laughs> 
So then I turn around fast and I look at um, Mike's nephew and I point to him and I said, are you into praying? Because I'm into praying, so we're going to pray right now. <laughs> so I'm praying and praying and he's going, yes, yes. So I'm just declaring God's, God's kingdom here, God's kingdom here, because again, it just comes in. So you just got to press through, just keep declaring. Anyways, so we got to Charles Lemoyne Hospital. The doctors are not available to operating on him, so they send him out to Notre Dame Hospital. So I get in the ambulance, and I go. We get there. For the first time, the ambulance drivers don't even understand why the emergency doors are locked. They can't get in with their car. They're wondering, I don't understand this because they have a special buzzer. It's not working. So we get out and we walk around, and Mike's in the gurney or whatever, and so we're trying to go through the doors of the emergency. They're locked. We can't get in. And the guy's going to a secret button that there is to try to push it, and it won't open. So the guy goes out, looks in the window, and he goes, <laughs> what's going on? And so they finally open the door, but we get pushed into a scenario that's happening. There is a woman who is in the ambulance station area that is uncontrollable. She is just wild, and nobody knows what to do with her. So you have all these ambulance drivers, all these nurses and everything, and they're, they don't know what to do. So the lady that is in charge, a doctor is telling her off. And she is just getting aggravated and aggravated and miserable and miserable. And this is the person that we have to talk to, who is not in a really good mood. Who are you? Who are you? I had to find out who I was. <laughs> so she is miserable, not talking to me very nicely, and just saying, oh, just go over there and register him. And it's like, where? You know, and then the ambulance told her, guy said, relax to her. And then he came out and showed me what to do. So I was there. And, uh, and then I finally came out and found Michael because they took him somewhere. And they were starting to get him ready for the operation. And then this lady, who's not very happy with me, came in and told me, you can't stay here. You, you know, you have to go back home. And I said, well, I came with the ambulance. I don't have a way home. It's 1030 at night now. And, uh, and, and I'm just going to stay here and wait and see. And she goes, no, it's going to be like three or four hours. There's nowhere to go. And she was really miserable. And so I could have in my old days kind of said a few things. <laughs> but who are you? So I was just standing there. And Mike's looking at me. And I'm looking at him and going, I don't know where you're going to be. How am I going to know what's going on? And then the, another nurse said, no, just stay here. So I said, okay. So I'm just standing here patiently. And then the nurse comes in, and she gets and I said, I don't know where he's going to be. I don't have any phone numbers. So she runs out, gets me a phone number, says, here. And then she goes away, and the lady says, no, just stay here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm staying here. Unbeknownst to me, the surgeon is in their same room. And she comes walking towards me, all calm and everything, and she starts talking to me and telling me what's going to happen. And so start to feel a bit more calmer. And uh, this is the top surgeon of Montreal, by the way. She's gone to Kuwait to teach doctors there. Uh, she's, she's, she's going to all sorts of places. Anyways, so she says to me, um, don't worry, we're going to find a place for you. And I said, oh, thank you, you know. And she says, just, just follow me. This is a surgeon follow me. So I followed her, and then she said, you know, I'm going to give you a call uh, when things are ready. And I said, well, you know, I came here by the ambulance. There's no place. She goes, just follow me. <laughs> so I followed her all the way up to the operating room, all the way up there. Where, you know, I, there was this door that went sliding forth, uh, back and forth, and if I would have moved like that, the door opened, and then they all went through, and then I was wondering, why is the door still open while well, standing in front of the electric <laughs> eye? And I didn't know, but I could hear what they were saying. And this surgeon was making sure that she found a place for me to stay that night. It was like favor 
like I, I, I couldn't believe this favor that she was giving me. And so I, these are the things that I am thankful for, that in the midst of this time of stress and anxiety, that I was receiving favor of the Lord, and it was really awesome. It doesn't end there, though. It's just, it's just amazing. And then so he's getting ready to go. Go and she comes out and she goes, oh, yes, um, we found a place for you. You can stay in your husband's room when he gets there, um, the same room that he'll be in after. And uh, why don't you just say goodbye to him? You know, say, you know, say your farewells, you know, bye. Uh, okay, so I go up, and this is in the operating room. <laughs> and I'm hugging him and all that. And then I come out and she goes, I'll walk you to the elevator. What? Top surgeon is going to walk me, know me, to the elevator. And that wasn't just across the hall. We had to go down and around. So we get there in front of the elevator, and we're talking. And uh, most of you know that, uh, well, unfortunately, we've already gone through something similar with Scott with his fingers. And so I was talking to her about his fingers, how they weren't able to save them. And she was saying how long ago that was, four years. Well, we've learned a lot. So she was just talking to me and said, we're going to do everything to try and save this. Don't worry about it. We get to the elevator. She even tells me how to, what do I do when I get up from the elevator? Where do I go? I couldn't believe it. It was just favor, favor. So that she shakes my hand and I go up and then I go to the nurse's place and there's favor again. I go and lay down on a couch. Some guy says, here, would you want a pillow? <laughs> yes. I got the pillow, and I said to the nurses' station, I said to them, um, by the way, um, could you, I'm going to be over here, so when the doctor tells me to come and see my husband, can, this is where I'm going to be. And they're going, yeah, right. They were shocked that the doctor told me to come, that the doctor was going to come to tell me what's happened to Mike. Favor. Because it never happens. So when the time came, I went to the nurse station and said, okay, so the doctor said that I can come and see him in the, um, what's that? The recovery room, which never happens. So I go, and I'm there standing them saying that the doctor said that I can go to the recovery room. And they're going, no, nobody ever goes there. Never, ever does anybody go there. And I said, well, Dr. Lassard said that I could go. And then the nurse who got the information said, yes, the doctor said, why don't you call and ask the doctor? So she called, and I can hear her going, are you okay with this? Is it all right? <laughs> so I, I get to go. Ben came, actually. He, he came to uh, give me Chelsea's sweater. <laughs> so it was great to have Ben there with me. And we went down to go and see Mike. Favor of the Lord. It is just from one thing to another thing, we've just seen the hand of God going through and coming, coming out. And uh, for you to know that uh, Mike's toe is saved, thank God. He had his um, operation, on, um, well, operation. It was uh, taking off the leftover dead skin, and, um, and then he took skin, skin grafts. And so he's waiting. Um, maybe Friday he'll be able to come out. Um, but they've saved the toe. But by the way, I want to tell you that they never save toes. This is another favor of the Lord. That um, the doctor said to him that I'm putting uh, my best nurses on you. I'm putting the best doctors to make sure that everything is, um, is good. And that we're going to do our best to get this saved. Um, she says this is our pet project. Yeah, wow, this is the favor of the Lord. It's, it's just amazing all what has happened and all what's been going through. Um, he's been fighting an uh, infection um, because we have a dog and he was cutting grass. Unfortunately, just before he kind of sliced the, um, the stool bag that we have for our dog, and so there was stool on the blades, and so when it accident happened, um, there is a type of infection from dogs that if transferred to humans can be very deadly. So he's been, uh, he's been on um, antibiotics, uh, severe antibiotics for that. So I have seen throughout this whole time where we have um, 
the doctor saying, one doctor saying, no, it's coming off, the other doctor saying, no, it's fine, and, and them even giving really bad results about it, you know? And I'm just saying, no, I'm focusing on higher. I'm focusing on the promises of God. I'm focusing that no matter what, this is going to be okay. Whether Mike's toe is there or not is not the issue. Because in the big picture of life, it's just a toe. There are people who don't have limbs, people who don't have you know, all sorts of body parts. It's just, it's just when you, you see your loved one in pain, it's, that's what you're focusing on is, is the pain. You don't want them to see that. And so I've seen that he's, he's been taken care of, and I'm just so thankful for that. And it is just awesome. And I think that, you know, being there and knowing who you are in circumstances is that how I think, God, how did I get like this? How, did, how, is, how am I able to cope with all this without doing the old man stuff, <laughs> you know? And I think that if I go back in my life and I see how God has got me through other situations in life and he's brought me through that and how I have been because I want to, to please God's heart and I want to be the person that God destined me to be, that I tried to find out what stops me from being who God intended me to be. And I kind of dig and, uh, and find out why do I react negatively, negatively when I shouldn't? Why do I have trouble bringing God's kingdom in? And I try to, to think about that and say, okay, God, I want you to heal me. And be open to that, to being healed. So that I can experience God's love. I can experience him more. If I have obstacles in my way, I can't do it. It's impossible. So, it's, it's something that we need to push forward for. It just doesn't happen like this. It's just not a one-time, okay, I'm healed, I'm done. <laughs> it's a lifetime thing that we need to dig deep and see, okay, what's stopping me from being who I'm going to be? Because, you know, as the church, well, there's a hurting world out there. If we go and proclaim the gospel, but if we go and we say it in a way or express it in a way that is not becoming of Christ, then we've lost our salt. We are not light anymore. And we're hindering people from coming in and finding and experiencing God's love for themselves. So we need to say, Father, heal us. Heal us deeply. Get to those deep, deep wounds so that we can be a true expression of your love. So that I don't have to be in performance trap or a blame-shifting trap or carry my hurts with me as I try to explain God's love. And then the obstacles that I put on myself for receiving, I express those to people. That's not truly God's heart. So, <laughs> we do have a couple of courses coming up. And if you don't think it's for you, maybe there's something stopping you from thinking it's for you. Really, ask God. Get through the pride. Get through all this stuff and see what, how the awesome healing that God can bring and see what he does with you and in different circumstances in your life, when the darkness starts coming in, how can you really stand up and be who you are in Christ? Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Sandy. Um, Pastor Kathy's going to come and just kind of wrap it up a bit. But, uh, you know, we, we say over and over again in this church that, that hurt people hurt people and and it's true if we don't if we're not if we're hurting we will end up hurting others but i heard a, a, another good one this last week that heal people heal people i thought man that's good because that gives me a positive motivator to be whole because if i can be whole to to my degree of wholeness i can heal other people i can be an instrument of healing and so i just really encourage you as has been said it's tuesday the Life's Healing Choices course, Wednesday, Embracing the Father's Love course, will really help you 
to become whole and able to minister to others, but also be whole in yourself, okay? So, Pastor Kathy, you are giving out something right now. You're giving out pieces of paper. We're just going to be about 10, 12 minutes more, and Pastor Kathy just wants to share a short devotional, and you'll take it. Okay. So take one or two, whatever color pleases you. There's also some pencil crayons as well. We're going to be doing something in a minute. I was, uh, I didn't know if Alyssa had her dancing lesson yesterday, so I ran into the place where they have it, and the lady was there, and I asked, is there dance? And I'm speaking English, and she's speaking French, and she goes, no, uh, pour la action de grâce. And I'm going, oh, that's Thanksgiving, and what a wonderful way to say it. I, I don't know that I'm translating properly, but to my English mind, action is a moving word. It's a doing word. It's a, it's a choosing to make a move word. Rather than thanks, like giving. Giving can be a very receiving word in thanksgiving, but action de grâce, action of blessing, that this is a time when we are called we remind ourselves to give an action of blessing. And you know, it is a very godly thing to do. I opened my, uh, my laptop, and I'm scrolling through and, and doing the search for all the Thanksgiving words in the Bible, because my assignment for this was to find a psalm of Thanksgiving. Well, folks... Several pages of psalms later, I'm still going, which psalm of thanksgiving do I choose? 136, we could have done it as a responsive. We sing it. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens? Who spread out the earth upon the waters? Who made the great lights? The sun to govern the day, the moon and stars to govern the night? His love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, to him who divided the Red Sea asunder and brought Israel through the midst of it. His love endures forever. He swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led the people through the desert, who struck down great kings and killed mighty kings. Silo, king of the Amorites, and Og of Bashan and gave his, their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to his servants Israel. His love endures forever. To the one who remembered us in our lowly estate and freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. And who gives food to every creature, give thanks to the Lord, God of heaven, his love endures forever. The language of the kingdom of God is praise and thanksgiving. The language of the kingdom of God is praise and thanksgiving. This doesn't deny that the righteous cry out. There is a difference between crying out to God and stating what is obvious my toe is dangling by a thread, and crying out to God with our need, between that and going, oh, poor me. Our grumbling and complaining, which is what the Israelites did in contrast to this psalm where they are praising, was to grumble and complain, to whine and wail. That is so different than when we cry out. Because as I studied these psalms, I love 92, it didn't quite work. But no, it's 34. There was 34. Ah, 
Sandy, as you were speaking, I knew this is it. It starts at 17. It's very interesting. This one, Psalm, so many of them start, Psalms, they start with troubles. Trouble, trouble, trouble. And then I get, when you look up Thanksgiving and, and, and it gives you the verses, I go, oh, all these thanks, give thanks to the Lord are at the end of the psalm. They're at the end of the psalm. I'm looking for a psalm that starts thanks at the beginning. There are a few, but it's the end of the psalm. And in the middle, it is the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. What? Some of you were told the Sunday school story that becoming a Christian was going to solve all your problems and make life really nice. No problems. And then we'll fly away. (laughs) I don't read that here. It's the righteous cry out. We have that wonderful thing. We cry out. And the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers them out of them all, for he protects all his bones. Not even the big toe will be broken (laughs) once we're done. (laughs) Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. We have so much to be thankful for. We don't have to just suck it up and be brave and only talk nice. We can cry out to God. And when our crying out turns to praise and thanksgiving, then we know we have been speaking kingdom language. Because we all know where our whining and boohooing and poor me goes. Today, I want to really establish with all of us that the kingdom language is the language of praise and thanksgiving. And I want to motivate you to take an action. You've got your little paper there. I know some of you are in seasons of grief. Some of you are in seasons of trial. Some of you are in seasons of need. But I want you, by a picture, by a word, in some way, take a moment and think, what am I thankful for? What can I thank God for in a concrete way? I want you to draw your picture, write your word, do your, you know, if you're wordy, write it up, fill it up with words. If you are a picture person, draw a picture. And I want to give you a minute or two to take an action of thanksgiving and write that down. Think about it. Then I'm going to offer you as we leave today to take the opportunity, just the doorway, just sticky your stickies all around the doorway and on the door, so we can make a gate of thanksgiving and a gate of praise to leave this place with today and also bring it in our hearts. Because no matter how dark things are, I mean, the cross had to be the darkest moment. Well, the, the sun went out. Moment of all time. Christ faced it for the joy set before him. And he has that for us in him. Does he not? Amen. I could share so much more. Because as I go on and on with thanksgiving, I realize that it is not just in the Psalms and Old Testament. But thanksgiving is some of my favorite New Testament verse. The one I learned as a babe in the Lord, it has stuck with me forever and ever. Um, Philippians 4. We look to verse 4. I don't even know if I really need it, but here it is, somewhere hiding. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your patience be known to all men, for the Lord is at hand. In nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, 
whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. The things you have both learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do, and the God of peace will be with you. Not just the peace of God, but the God of peace. And I share this Philippians passage with you, particularly verse 8, because I believe in this, whatsoever things, think on these, that is the answer That is the action that needs to be applied in our lives if we are to be a thankful people. And when we are a thankful people, we are a people of victory. Also in the Psalms, whenever there is trouble and then there is thanksgiving, then there is victory. And we have victory in Jesus. But my instruction to you through Paul is whatsoever things keep a guard on your hearts and minds. Amen? Okay. Okay, some of you are still writing, so you can still sit for a minute, but I'm just going to close in prayer. Uh, yeah, if you need extra, thank, if you're really thankful, there's lots of paper left. And as soon as we're done, please do not leave the building until you stick this on the door f- frame, around the door. And uh, as a testimony of thanksgiving to God today, put some wings on our thankfulness today. Father, in Jesus' name, we are a thankful people. Thank you, God, for all you've done for us. And thank you, God, that even today, in whatever situation we're in, we can still trust you, seek you, call out to you, cry out to you, and believe that you're going to move on our behalf. So, Lord, we are truly thankful to be your sons and daughters today. We thank you for the depth of your love towards us. And we thank you for your ongoing provision and protection in our lives. We are a thankful people. And we say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have an awesome day. I know a lot of you are spending time with family or today or tomorrow. Um, enjoy the Lord this amazing weekend. But share your thankfulness with others. Share your thankfulness with your relatives, your friends, your neighbors. And let's see if we get them talking kingdom language, okay? God bless you. Amen.